sets us free to serve. He, we're warned in the New Testament, don't, don't use your freedom as a, as a cloak, as something to, to hide behind and commit licentiousness, but rather use your freedom to glorify God, lift up the name of Jesus Christ, advance the gospel. And that's part and parcel of the giving of the charismata, the gifts. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll read together again verses 1 through 11. We will uh, zero in on that last section. We began last week looking at the, at the specific manifestations, these nine manifestations of, of giftedness and see if we can grasp, have the Lord teach us how this, these things occur for the common good, to strengthen the body, to advance the gospel. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, as we're thinking about an informed understanding of spiritual gifts. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit. There are varieties of service with the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord continue to teach us. And I hope as we're studying through this, my, my prayer for you has been, Lord, stir up in our people as they're reading over this, hearing this, meditating on it, discovering and manifesting the charismata that you implanted in each one when by grace through faith you saved each one and made him or her a partaker of the divine nature. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we have come through these, just to remind you quickly, just this verses 1 through 31 talk about the, the test of speaking in the Spirit, the diversity of spiritual gifts, which is where we are and have been for several weeks. In the illustration of the body, where we're going to be picking up uh, in, a, in a week or two. So in this, this diversity of the gifts, it's, it's affirmed in verses 4 to 7. We've already looked at that. It's explained in verses 8 to 10. It'll be summarized in verse 11. And so let's just, let's just jump in today and remind you that in verse 8 that we looked last week at this utterance of wisdom what it is. We looked at the utterance of knowledge. We looked at faith as, as a spiritual gift, not saving faith, but the gift of faith. We looked at, at miraculous powers. Today we look at gifts of healing. We told you last week that the miraculous powers, yes, yes the apostles manifested some, but not most of how Jesus manifested miraculous power. No apostle ever fed multiplied thousands of people with a boy's lunch. No apostle ever calmed stormy, stormy seas. These were demonstrations Jesus showed to authenticate that he had come from God with the power of God to forgive sins. And we looked at that last week. So in terms of gifts of healing, some believers had the specific gift of healing the sick. 
while others had a more general miracle working power. We want to see this. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 40. Peter sent them all outside. If you remember in the, in the tragedy where, where a Tabitha or Dorcas had, had died in the Acts 9.40, and they're weeping because she was a very generous, loving person. Peter put them all outside, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Brought back to life, resuscitated. Now, let's make a distinction between resuscitated and resurrected. Someone resuscitated would die again. Lazarus, brought from, from death to life by Jesus, died again. Resurrection is brought back from the dead never to die. There's a difference. Resuscitation, just keep our language clean here and, and right. And then in Acts 13, 11, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You'll be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him. The causing of blindness by the apostles, Elimus specifically here, in view. Healings, in, as you read through the New Testament, is a temporary sign gift that was used by, and let's just let's snapshot with me, Christ in Matthew 8, 16, and 17. We're told that that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. When, when you read about or have the unfortunate providence of watching these movies of demonic exorcism and People are thrown all over the room and, and all that stuff. That makes for great theater, but it just there's nothing like it in the scriptures. It's just lacking in biblical warrant. The closest you can come to those, by the way, is, is when the fellow in the New Testament uh, tried to cast out demons in the name of, of Paul and Jesus, and the demons said, Now we know Jesus. We know Paul. Well, these were the sons of Siva that tried. We don't know you, though, and they beat the stuffings out of these guys. That's more akin to the movies that are out there today, but not New Testament demonic exorcism. Verse 17 says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Misunderstood by many that when he, when he died on the cross, he took all disease with him so that nobody ever had to get sick again. That's nice sounding, it's just not the meaning of the text. And it's caused a great deal of heartache and confusion in the church today. Matthew 10, 1, Jesus called to him his 12 disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. The authority to do that. Not to leave the world without disease or affliction. So Jesus manifested this to show that he had authority over everything. We told you last week in, in Mark's gospel, the, the paralytic dropped down in the courtyard where Jesus is teaching. Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. They were looking for a healing. He knows what's in their minds. They're, they're grumbling. Uh, the, the Pharisaic leaders are grumbling that are sitting in the courtyard. The, the friends are puzzled. Which is easier, he says, to say your sins are forgiven, which you, you have no quantifiable way to observe in that transaction, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, that what I just said I have the authority to do. I say to you, the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he got up and walked. The idea there that the visible should validate the invisible. So he appointed the 70 to do that. He appointed, uh, there were a few of the associates of the apostles who engaged in this. Acts chapter 8, verse 5 to 7. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So you have, you have Philip who was, who was uh, initially among the band of the, of the servants chosen to take care of the controversy. And he sent, he's, he's sent out as an evangelist to a Samaritan situation where revival breaks out. 
The Apostle Paul recognizes in 2 Corinthians, the, the, the second letter beyond the one that we're studying now, chapter 12, verse 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Remember now, we're going to see when we get to 1 Corinthians 13 that a lot of these um, what we call remarkable gifts or the manifestation of these sign gifts are given in the absence of a written, codified canon of Scripture. It's a validation expression. If you read Paul carefully in his missionary journeys and acts and in his letters, you'll see that when he moves into an area where he had not been, that had not been exposed to the gospel, signs and wonders attend his, his arrival there to validate the gospel. Now, the fact that the idea that, that people are not going around today healing like this themselves does not mean God is not still healing. Many of us could stand and give testimony how God intervened in situations in our lives that, that looked bleak, physically and medically bleak. And his people prayed. And the subsequent report was that the concern of the malady was gone. He still answers the prayers of faithful people. Look at James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. James is teaching, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Anyone among you sick? The word sick there now is not, I've got a cold, it's the idea that is sick unto death. You, you have been given a, a death sentence. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. We, we looked at this before studying through this passage, the sequence here and how it's totally misused today. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The symbolic, remember now, the symbolic to the real, it's a gospel approach. The oil representing the, the Holy Spirit. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, you'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. All right? So that is the, that's, that's the teaching of Scripture. God still heals today. So I don't want you to misunderstand because this is what people do. They, they want to cling tenaciously, and you may know people like this, to this notion that they know a healer or they themselves are a healer. And when people begin to, to try to put that in context and call the question, then they will say, well, you're just dismissing that God even healed. No, we're not. God has healed me in my journey. But he healed, not some self-proclaimed healer. Well, let's flip the coin real quickly before we go. The gift of, healing, gift of healings was never used solely for bringing people physical health. You need to understand that. These people who teach that God doesn't want anybody to be sick. Jesus took our diseases on himself at the cross. He gave Paul and, and Peter and others, and he's given me the ability to heal. He doesn't want anybody sick. Sounds good, particularly if you're desperately ill. Think about this with me for a few minutes. Paul was sick. The apostle Paul was sick. He never healed himself or never asked another human being to heal him. Whatever you think about the thorn in the flesh, what it was, it was debilitating for Paul. Paul's friend Epaphroditus, Philippians 2, 27, was near death. Look, indeed he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul does not give one hint that he healed Epaphroditus. He says God healed him. It was a merciful showing of God, and it was merciful to me too, because had I lost Epaphroditus, I would have lost a lot. When Timothy was sick, 1 Timothy 5, 23, Paul did not heal him, but he gives him some advice. 
1 Timothy 5, 23, no longer drink only water, which by the way, you could, you could more likely than not get dysentery from drinking water in the first century. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Wait a minute. If Paul's got this uh, just on-demand demonstration to heal, I mean, surely Timothy was valuable to him. Why, why would Paul tell Timothy to take some medicinal steps for his, quote, frequent ailments? Trophimus. Remember, Paul never had more workers and helpers than he needed. One of the, one of the things that comes up throughout the New Testament is he's, he's being abandoned by workers and helpers. Trophimus at Miletus. Look at 2 Timothy 4.20. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. If healing is an on-demand reality, and Paul is having his helpers and workers spread thin, carrying on the ministries where he's leaving, why would he leave anybody anywhere ill if healing is only about making everybody healthy? And then you see the just to give you a snapshot and we close here. They were not the everyday norm in Paul's ministry, these healings. But they did occur when he entered a new region. And we'll give you one example, and that's Malta. And the region of Malta in chapter 28 of Acts, verses 8 and 9. It happened that after the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. Notice, and when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. What do you think is happening there? He's getting an audience. A man's come to their area that they have not known previously. He's got a message that will not sit well with people who are just taking it in, and it's a, it's a call to deny themselves. Yet this man has demonstrated that healing powers attend his journey. And he has a crowd. And God's enabling him to heal many. And now he has a forum to preach the gospel. And if you backtrack from that, the last instance you have of something like that is Acts chapter 14. So you go from Acts 14 to Acts 28 to see Paul engaged in something like this. You back up from that you have Peter in Acts chapter 9, and then what we read about the, the resuscitation of, of, of Tabitha. And if you read on beyond ch chapter 9, verse 40 and 41, you see in, chap in chapter 9, 42, people received the gospel that Peter preached. So, let's be clear. This is, these are sign gifts. A sign given, not to validate the person so much as to validate the message the person would bring, the gospel. And if you put those lenses on, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, a lot of the confusion about spiritual gifts falls away. We read from Acts 10, the home of Cornelius, Gentiles. They received the Holy Spirit just as we did at Pentecost. What's that telling you? That that's a, that's a normative event, or it's a reference point for the gospel to establish a hearing. By the way, the home of Cornelius was converted <laughs> as he preached the gospel. And so this is, this is I think, a, what you will read if, you're, if you do an honest, uh, objective reading of the Scripture is that these remarkable gifts, and we're going to get into the, some more of them, of uh, we're going to look at, at uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues. But these remarkable gifts were sign gifts to establish a beachhead for the gospel to be received. I'm, I'm closing now, I promise you. In that culture, and in any culture today where the gospel has not had an exposure, power, it's what matters. And if you can demonstrate that the God you're proclaiming has heretofore not seen power, then they will listen. 
they will listen. What about you? You have a Bible, one or two or three or four or five or six. You have the Bible on digital devices. You have it, you can watch it in, in media presentations. You can listen to it in audio Bibles. What about it? You see, we're without excuse. The Bible has so proliferated in this culture. We don't need sign gifts in this culture. We need to access the Word of God, these wonderful words of life. And as we all rush headlong toward eternity, I haven't read this, but I've surmised it from the Scripture. We will stand before God and be asked, what did you do with my book? What did you do with my son? And all will be without excuse. Do you realize the people in unreached tribes around the world will face less judgmental accountability than you and I do? Uh, They'll go to hell without Jesus. But the hottest hell is reserved for those who had access and spurned it. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow now before you in Jesus' name. We, oh Lord, we're so grateful today. I just, we sweep across the landscape and everywhere we look is tokens of your goodness and mercy. But chief among them, you have given us your word. We don't have to, to be like the people we read about who, who walk miles and miles with a, with a, a sheet, a, a page out of Scripture looking for someone to tell them more about this one. We, we can read your word from night to day. We can listen to your word. We can, we can watch it visualized. There's so many ways we have access. Oh, God, find us faithful. Find us faithful. And then, Lord, help us to believe the gospel, to live the gospel, to cultivate those wonderful grace gifts that you've designed, that you implant in the lives of everyone whom you save to make the church run, to make the church work, to make the ministry effectual to give it mission energy. So help us as followers of Christ to love you and to love others, one another particularly, and others, and to commit to serve the world because you've planted in us the charismata, which enables us and provokes us to do just that. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.